Welcome to the chaos. <laughs> oh man, what up everybody? Well, you do the opening line for it. What up everybody? Welcome to the chaos. My name is Michael Tableman. And I am Danny J. Gomez. Yes. Reverse that. <laughs> <laughs> Today in the show we have to, today in the show we have a good friend to the show. He's been a homie for a long time. We love him and appreciate him. He's been a hospitality guru for a long time, and he can definitely give you some really good insight. And the man has definitely grown and been through a lot over the years. And I'm super proud of the person that this that this man has become. Everybody, Justin Aquino. Yeah. Welcome, sir. <sighs> what up? What round up? Round two for you, huh? Round two. Good to be on the the chaos once again. Well, the, the you were on it once, but your episode didn't air the first time. We, yeah. had to, we had to get a little bit better and you know bring it up a little bit. I do miss the uh, the backroom casting couch vibe. <laughs> was, I mean, yeah, I get it. It was comfy. It was comfy. I you know, nice. I felt like I was you know, no things were gonna happen when I walked in. It was just three of us, but here we are. Now you come in as a whole set. There's people. There's definitely, definitely all the, this shit going on. The game has changed and um, everything looks like it's progressing, which is a great thing. So, mm -hmm. all right. So give us a little bit uh, about you behind the scenes, just quickly, like how you got into hospitality, what you did, and then we'll kind of segue into where you are now and some of the topics we wanted to touch on. Cool. So yeah, I um, was attending college and um, pretty much just kind of wasn't feeling it too much. I felt like just being in the classroom and, and dealing with a lot of that was. A little bit off for me and um so i actually took a dishwasher position at a pizza place and um that was my first kind of foray into the uh, culinary world uh, moved up pretty quick um, started prepping and and started working into more restaurants that were more local and started focusing on that more than i did my actual education uh finished school pretty quick and then um actually enrolled in culinary school went through culinary school um realized of how much of a worthless education that it provided. Um, cause while I was working in restaurants, while I was in school, um, that's where you got a majority of, of, of the school of hard knocks is learning actually being in the room. You know, it's like you can go through training all day, but until you're actually like in it, it's, it's definitely not the same. So working definitely was more so my education, um, work my, work my way up, um, started with patina group, which is, if you're familiar with patina group, it's six, it was like the group to be in when it came down to hospitality and, and restaurants in, in Los Angeles. Um, and then kind of worked my way up, um, eventually became a chef with Mastro's, which is probably the most known thing that I was a part of. Um, and yeah. And then fast forward into today, like that's pretty much how I got started. And I know we'll kind of dive into a little bit more deeper into everything else, you know, the, the further we kind of go along. So. Man, in the chef life, you were killing it. And on top of that, you also had a meal prep company where you would prep meals for some big UFC fighters. Jay Balvin was one of your big clients. Well, like, yeah. yeah, still, still, still one of my clients. I still prep for Jose and his wife uh, when they're in town. Um, so still kind of deal with them, which is great. You know, shout out to Jose. I mean, I, I watched this documentary. Like, I didn't know the man dealt with as much anxiety as he does. Yeah. And, like, yo, it was so inspirational because, like, he has all these things that he does before the show. And, like, for me, before I'm performing, even when we're doing this, my anxiety is through the roof. So it's like, yo, man, that was really cool because I didn't ever even thought about that. Yeah. To do shit along those lines. Yeah, definitely. He's very grounded, honestly. Like, would you think with a superstar that that's big and so international? Like, he's just a cool dude. And I've seen the way he treats everybody around him and, like, with Bash and, in um in Pope his DJ like everyone's so welcoming and like just their vibe is not something you would expect from someone that's so successful you know so but I got to give you a lot of credit because you did something that a lot of people thought about during the pandemic but didn't really do and you just dove and head in you were like yo th everything in the food world is becoming too expensive you were over the headache and you were just like F it and just quit. Like, yo, props to you, man. Not a lot of people, like, nothing lined up. You're just like, yo, you know what? Mentally, this isn't f***ing helping me anymore. This isn't serving me. I'm out. So, yeah. like, tell us about that because that, bro, that takes a lot of f***ing balls. So, um, more towards the end of pandemic when things were just kind of inflation was rising, a lot of costs for food just started going up. Honestly, I was just kind of unhappy with what I was doing and I just felt like I needed to change. So, I shut down the business, something that I built, you know, over the course of six years and built a huge, you know, kind of venue for, to house, uh, the employees and offices. And then, um, pulled away from, uh, my project in Santa Monica I was, uh, um, with the Victorian, 
um, during pandemic, they needed to find a way to turn a bar and nightclub into a venue to make money and you had to serve food to make money. So they brought me on. I'm, I'm friends with all the owners and they're, they're great, great guys. And, um, um, pretty much turned it into a machine that was doing about 80 grand to hundred grand a week, operating five days out of the week with only outdoor seating and, um, got them through pandemic and now they're back to doing what they do and they're crushing and, and that's great. And, um, yeah, once I pulled out of that, I just kind of took a break and, um, took, took off like the last few months. And honestly, it was more of a struggle than you think pulling away from the business. I thought it would be better for my mindset. And in actuality, actually, I started to struggle a little bit more with my identity. Um, I was always known as, you know, the guy running the the very popular venue or, you know, dealing with the celebrities and athletes on a day-to-day basis. And, and that was my true identity. And then I found myself like not having one. And, um, we've spoke on this, you know, a lot, Mikey, but like, I, I started to struggle mentally and, and started to kind of go down a different path. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was really tough. Um, but then, you know, we, we want to feed as many people as we can and, and kind of do get back to doing what I love and that's making food and, and serving people and just kind of putting like smiles on faces through food. So I have a question about when you left the industry and you were losing your identity, like how did you deal with that? What did you find to fill your life in other, in, in other ways? Like, did you um, get new hobbies or did you just kind of shut in? Honestly, I started doing sales. I, so I took a sales job. And it was extremely tough to kind of dive into it. A, I I felt very infantile in what I was doing just because I didn't know uh, what I was doing exactly. And um, it was a difficult transition. And even till now, like finding the footing in it was extremely tough because I built my life and my career around food. And that was my passion. That was my art. And that was everything that, that I was known for. And then to just kind of dive into something that was completely different, which I I did have a bit of a knack for, but it was, it still didn't make me happy. You know, like, I mean, financially was, was good and it was well, but I mean, honestly, like when, when, when people say I'd rather do what I love and make less money than make a ton of money and and not do what I love. Like it was, I really understood it more than ever by making the transition to doing something that I wasn't accustomed to. So, yeah. And that's where, that's where I dove into more of um, my struggles is like trying to find the identity was, you know, I'm like not a chef, I'm not a chef anymore. And trying to give a hundred percent to something that, that didn't, there was no passion behind it for me. So, and that's where I struggled was not having that passion anymore and, and not having that drive of doing what I love. And that, that, that's definitely what, made me kind of fall down a very difficult path as of late. So so you would say that kind of taking a break from it and stepping away really helped you find your clarity of like, you know, I don't need this to be my identity, but I still really love food and something in that aspect. Mm-hmm. I mean, it makes me appreciate more what I've done over the, the course of my life. Um, not just that, but like the amount of people that have worked for me and that I've inspired to kind of pursue their own personal careers and where they're at in their careers and how much they've grown. Um, from when they started working for, for me and with me until now, um, like that's extremely fulfilling. You know, I think like, like definitely Kobe said it best is, you know, like to inspire people is, is more legendary than, than anything statistical in that aspect, you know, and just inspiring that person to inspire the next person. That's, that's leaving a legacy more than anything else. And watching these people just kind of provide for their families and do their thing and, and grow and and make careers out of like, you know, the little time they spent with me just to kind of as a stepping stone, like that's so much more rewarding than, than trying to pursue making just like a ton of money in, in whatever you do. It's, it's so much more rewarding. So. Yeah. I mean, and brother knowing you now for quite a while, Mm -hmm. I don't think you give yourself enough credit for that. Like you are such a big hearted person Mm -hmm. with so much love to give and so many people gravitate towards you that I think you need to pat yourself on the back a little bit more, man, because you really do inspire a lot of people and you do do a lot for a lot of people. Like as much as you call me for for f- advice, I love yeah. that I can call you and be like, "Yo, man, today I'm um, this, this, and this," and you know we can just shoot this because sh- mm. you actually really care about people. Yeah. And food is such an important part of people's lives. Like you can have one meal and remember it for the rest of your <clears throat> life. 
So you're definitely touching people in that way as well. Definitely. Feeding the soul in their belly. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, it it was it was crazy just like, you know, just kind of go through and shuffle through the career. Um, going through, like, especially when I was working with Mastro's in Beverly Hills and Vegas and Chicago and opening all the new restaurants for that, for that brand, um, I, I met and just kind of met, honestly, some of the best people in this industry through what I do. I mean, honestly, that's how I met a majority of the people that I – that I associate with of today. Like my best friends are people that I've met through hospitality. And I think that, that this, this line of work really breeds some of the best people. I mean, I would, I would, I would put up against anything two years working in a restaurant over a four year education, any day of the week. Um, you, you definitely learn more and you learn more about life and people, um, dealing with issues and, and, and getting that education of hard work. Um, as opposed to reading a book and, and kind of in writing a paper. So I truly do believe that. What, what's something you could dive into? Because, you know, chefs are like rock stars now. I mean, they're on, t- they're on TV. There's so many celebrity chefs yeah. and there's so many movies coming out about chefs and, the, and fine dining. So what, what is a life of a, a person who is a chef? All the good and the bad. I mean, it's, it's a lot of long days, a lot of hard work. It's not as glamorized as what you see on TV or social media. Um, you're looking at someone who's away from their family. If they're married away from their kids, um, 60, 70 hour weeks are, are the bare minimum in this industry. Um, especially when you're kind of at the helm and controlling everything, uh, you really are steering the ship, a large ship full of a crew that's kind of listening and waiting for you to give them direction the whole time. So, but not just that, like even in the off time, you're also a counselor to these people that are looking to you for guidance because they have their own personal struggles. So it is, it is a heavy cross to bear. Um, but again, you know, like, I mean, like Mikey touched on, honestly, like I loved it and I still love it. And I still deal with a lot of my, my former employees, but, um, just the aspect of being a chef, like it's, it's very glorified. And I don't think people understand about like the difficulties it is to kind of to run a kitchen in that aspect, especially when you're running a monster that's doing anywhere from 15 to 20 million a year. Um, you're there, you're there early, you're there late. Um, you know, you're, you see memes of people eating on a milk crate on the line on the floor, which is a common thing. And Mm -hmm. usually my meals were kind of on the line, like eating something as quick as I can, you know, in the middle of service because we don't really have time. And that's just a part of the life. And, you know, it's funny because like, you know, especially with my own personal family, when we have meals together, like I consume my food so quick because that's just what I was always accustomed to. So everyone's still kind of diving into their plate and I'm like ready to go back and watch TV and, and finish the, the football game or something, you know what yeah. I mean? So um, it's it's definitely a change of pace. So yeah, it's it's definitely a difficult thing. It's it's not it's not all TikToks and in, in cooking shows. So yeah, that's something that I'll like, I, I worked in a lot of restaurants. <clears throat> I mean, so I've been in the service industry out since I was 16, mm-hmm. started in new Orleans. And I, 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 I dealt with a lot of chefs and for the longest time, I didn't know what they went through. Yeah. And like some chefs are just, they're, yeah, they're but you don't know what they're, what they've what gone they through, through to get to that point. And I know maybe some of them are jaded, some of them are just bitter, but there's a lot. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I mean, even a lot of the people that I work for, I work for some of the best guys. Um, but also on any given day, you don't know what they've dealt with and, you know, struggling relationships with, with family because you're so committed to your craft is very common. I, I honestly can't tell you that I haven't worked for a chef that hasn't been divorced. Wow. Um, it's just common. I mean, your first relationship is, is your passion, which is food. And, um, and I felt that too. And like, I, I know, like I've slept on the floor of a restaurant and taken, you know, what people what we call in the industry is a kitchen shower. It's a hot towel in the, in the walk-in <laughs> and you just kind of wipe down. And luckily enough, um, I had enough success that my uniforms were, were dry cleaned and pressed and sent to the restaurant. Um, so I always had clean clothes. Um, but yeah, like you, you definitely live there. People live, live at the restaurant. I've, I've slept in private dining rooms and, and, you know, on the floor and in the kitchen and just wherever you can get comfortable at times. And, and, and I know people have had it worse than I have. 
Um, I know people that have slept in attics because all their money has gone into a venue and they're just kind of hoping that it's, it's, it's going to be what turns their life around. So, so let me ask you, cause you mentioned before about, <clears throat> you know, taking a break, you thought it would go in one direction and it went the other. So how much of it, when you decided to take that break, did you really understand? Like you went from 60 hour weeks, 80 hour weeks to everybody in your face to quiet. Yeah. How did you deal with that? Because that's a really tough thing for everybody in our industry because it's so loud in one minute. And now it's not like it was quiet for a couple of days. You were just like, okay, what the f do I do now? And that's when it really sets in. Honestly, and that's kind of what kind of led me down a, um, like a negative path. I felt like all the time I had on my hands, I had so many plans for what I wanted to do, but then it just came down to it that like I never really just kind of did it with all the free time that I had. I just kind of felt like I was wasting it more than anything because there was things that I missed and it was a lot of thinking. And like when you think, when you overly think a lot of things, like it definitely, it's, it's sometimes it can lead you down a wrong path and um, wrong path as in like, like just, just dark thoughts. And but the only reason I keep on like going yeah. into it is again, what you did was so inspiring and there's so many people out there that want to do it. And hearing your story, I think, would make them take that jump because, like, you're preparing them and, like, hey, this is what you're going to go through. But, like, yo, man, you're on the other side and it's really yeah. cool. So I think a lot of people can really take a lot from that experience of yours if you're cool with opening opening up more Absolutely. about it. So um, the time off, I kind of had plans on things that I wanted to do and things I want to focus on. And and I took, like, more of a sales job where it was it was partial work. It was more working just a couple days out of the month. And then you're off for a longer period of time so you can kind of enjoy the fruits of your labor a little bit more. Something that I wasn't accustomed to working, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80 hours a week. Um, you don't get to enjoy anything because you're working the next day. So with all the free time, I just kind of find myself, I found myself as, man, it's so, it's so weird just kind of opening up and talking about this. Um I found myself safe space. We got you. No, for sure. So you're in the trust tree. Um, Circle of trust. I found myself trust. going down a path where I was unhappy with what I was doing so much that I I had thoughts that I always kind of I I looked down on people for having these thoughts. I thought that people were very weak minded in the aspect of you know, and this is the first time I really kind of said it, but a lot of like suicidal thoughts because I felt like I lost my image. And, um, I found myself just trying to sleep it off and not do anything and just wasting my time and, um, not, not being as, not being as, um, I mean, what's the word not being as like productive as I usually was. And I was usually extremely productive. Um, I would do the things that I love on my time off and I found myself just kind of sleeping my time away and, and just feeling bad for myself. And yeah, like the transition was hard, but then you know, you talk to the right people and they kind of get you back on tracks and, you know, you start planning for a couple of things and then you start seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. And, and that's kind of what helped me bounce back. Um, it was a struggle kind of just, it was relieved when I kind of stopped doing everything because I wasn't, I didn't need to be anywhere. The pressure was off, you know, I didn't have to worry about a lot of things, but things on the back end I had to take care of, which I still am taking care of to this day. And, um, Closing a business isn't easy. Um, there's there's a lot of things on the tail end that you have, really have to take care of. Um, yeah, but I mean, it it just kind of it kind of put me in a, in a tough spot mentally. Which, like I said, I've always I've always kind of questioned people's mental strength, and for the first time in my life, like I understood like how how difficult it is to kind of have those thoughts and how uncontrolled some of those thoughts are. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was really, really, really difficult going through that time. So a hundred percent. People like <clears throat> that happens to them and they're like, and they don't know that it's depression or anxiety. And they're just like, something's wrong with me. Like, yeah. but I don't know what it is. And, and depression is a beast. It take it, it takes every it part of your soul you and rips it apart. I mean, keeping it real, y'all. I had a massive panic attack last night. I'm sitting here mm -hmm. in an impressive episode currently. Yeah. I was about to walk into the gym and to go work out. And I called my buddy 
um, Jordan, he used to work for me. He's one of my sous chefs, like a little brother to me. And we were just kind of talking and we we're talking for about a good, like 45 minutes. And then I just kind of completely broke down and told him about what's been going on and how first time in my life, like I really, I really considered, um, taking my own life, which I've never, I've never understood how anybody can have those thoughts. And, and, and I, they were, they were right there in my lap and, and the first thing he told me to do was like, he's like, you gotta, you gotta call Mikey. He was like, you gotta call Mikey. He was like, I don't know how to deal with this. Like, like call Mikey. So, you know, I talked to Mikey the next morning and surprisingly that morning was my birthday. And I called Mikey. We talked for about an hour, hour and a half. And, um, surprisingly enough, it was about 20 minutes of, of me kind of unfolding to him and just kind of opening up. And then, Mikey just throws it right back to me and he was like, you know what? He's like, dude, he's like, I, I've had some, some issues just last night too. And so I'm struggling too. And then it, it just kind of reassuring that, that he can share that with me while I'm trying to share, knowing that like, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And I'm not only dealing with this because I'm telling you, man, this, this, this past the summer was, was definitely one of the test toughest months of my life with um the holidays and just kind of trying to find, myself and find what was going to make me happy again. And, and definitely I think I'm trending in that direction and I kind of already feel like, like things are on the up and up. And I made like a promise to myself to just to kind of say, fuck, whatever, whatever I'm doing, if, if it doesn't make me happy, then I don't want to do it. So, and that's more of the direction that I'm going in right now. And I really truly believe that I'm surrounded by some of the best people and, you know, we're just going to push forward. So I mean, I re- something I remember telling you, and I, I've said this to you before too, when you're making a change in life, it's always darkest before the dawn. So it's going to get darker. It's going to get harder before it gets light. But like, you're touching back. We've talked about this too. Yo, I have suicidal thoughts on the daily. Mm-hmm. On the daily. And most people would be surprised by that, but it's something that's not talked about enough. I mean, in males 24 to 40, it is the number one leading killer in all males. Mm. More guys take their own lives in any in that category than anybody else. And everyone's like, oh, I, I would have never thought of it, but it's been in their head constantly. Yeah. So it's like, really, you're not alone because so many people are like, whether they want to say it or not, that crosses a lot of people's minds more often than they like to talk about because people feel so ashamed about it. And like, yo, it's not a shame. It's a thought. Like life is f-ing hard. It's okay to have that thought. As long as you're not actually taking the steps to do it, there's a big difference between thinking it and having a tendency to do it. And that's when I told you or anybody else out there, if you feel a tendency, that's when you got to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. But talk to somebody before that. Yeah. Yeah. And take this time if you're listening, if you're struggling, like reach out. Any, any, you can reach out. Call our hotline. Call the hotline because you shouldn't be alone. And I mean, we've seen in the past two years, so many people that we know as like celebrities take their lives that we thought were completely fine. I mean, last, just by image alone, of course. Last season, we sat here and we did 38 episodes and me and you knew every single person. We learned something new about every person that sat here and not something like, oh, a happy time. We learned of a struggle that they were dealing with that was so severe, they had suicidal thoughts. They were depressed, but they hit it because that's what we're supposed to do in our industry. That's what mm-hmm. we're supposed to do it in society, especially as male. And I was just so taken back. Like I learned so much about some people that I thought were like my best friends. And I'm like, I never thought that you went through something like that. Yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's not, it's not surprising now that I know that this affects everyone. But for a long time, you thought did, it was only you. Yeah. And you did too. And I thought the same thing i thought i'm f-ing crazy and i gotta keep i gotta keep my mouth shut because we're in industries that are so cutthroat it's like if i say something to somebody they're gonna use it against me and i am f-ing. and also if you come out and say you're having these thoughts you're labeled as f-ing crazy mm-hmm. and then people write you off right away but you know the most valuable thing that you said to me and I actually wrote it down on my mirror so every time i'm getting ready in the morning i kind of read over it and you said the most valuable thing I think anybody said to me, um, you told me that thoughts are not actions. And um, that really pulled me through like the difficult time that I was dealing with. And I was like, you know what? He's right. He's right. He's right. That kind of lifted me up to just kind of go through. And I was like, man, I was like, that's so true. I was like, you know what? I didn't, I didn't act on any of my thoughts and, and that's the important part. So, yeah. yeah. So that definitely thoughts, thoughts are not actions. No. Put I that like- up, put it on a shirt. And then people have those thoughts constantly. We go through depressions and like, yo, it doesn't get easier. Like I have those thoughts every day. It doesn't get easier. Mm -hmm. 
I've just gotten better at learning myself and learning how to deal with it because that's the toughest part. Like there's, there's no manual for this. There's no script. There's no, like, if you're feeling like this, do this. If you're feeling like this, do like that doesn't exist because we're own, we're each our own individuals. How I bounce back, how Danny bounces back, how you bounce back is different. All three of us, then Zeke, then JP, then Soph, like we're all our own people. So like, I can tell you one thing, but it might not work for you. Mm-hmm. It's definitely not a one size fits all. Every every situation has its own ebb and flow, and yeah, definitely. And you know, it's it's weird. The more that I open up about this, and there's a very limited amount of people that that know what I've kind of dealt with. Um, it causes them to kind of open up and and let me know that they go through the same shit. So it's, I hate to say that it's reassuring, but it's also kind of comforting knowing that I'm not alone. Yeah. So it's something you always say, it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. And we feel that because we don't feel okay, we're not being productive. Like the other night it was my best friend's birthday and I got invited to his, his dinner. I didn't go. I just, I was so full of anxiety and like my stomach was messed up. So like that gave me anxiety and I just didn't want to be at a dinner and I just didn't go. But before I would have forced myself to go sit in in that anxiety, make it worse, not be present, not be there for my friend. And I was like, I'm not helping anyone, including myself, who I need to watch out for. Mm-hmm. So like, you don't always have to do that. You don't always have to go to the party. You don't always have to go to the event. If you want to stay home and relax, follow that and, and, and chill, right? I've noticed a lot of my friends be really like open and respectful of it because back in the day same thing i would force myself to go and then i'd be awkward and weird and that'd be it but if i'm just like yo i'm just really having a tough day they're like all right cool yo stay home you need something yeah like same thing like when you open up about it you realize yo the world isn't as bad of a place as it really seems Mm -hmm. like people are empathetic you just got to kind of open the door you got to find the right people yeah 2023 is a year of staying in i mean i've I've been about that staying in life for a (laughs) A minute. I For don't. Sure. I don't like going out places. I'm area. You, bro, it's awful. I'm, I'm curious. Like, as somebody who's passionate about food, like I'm passionate about movies, acting. Like I, you know, I dream of it. I close my eyes. I think of you know scenes. Like as as a person, a chef, when you go to sleep, do you see the the smash burger? Do you see the the patty hitting the grill and smashing? And you see yourself d- dusting it. <laughs> okay. Salt on top. Right, straight up. Yeah, okay. okay. So I've I've had like two. <laughs> I've had two. Of the most random dreams last two nights. One of the dreams was I was trying to do a tasting for somebody, but I couldn't find any of my ingredients. So I was trying to make this meal, but everything that I wanted wasn't there. And it was just like one of those like, what, what's going on? You know, it was just kind of freaking me out. And the other dream, which is not food related, but it was, um, (laughs) this was last night, uh, Mike Tyson (laughs) Came up to me and was he asked me to help him sell this new um, like aerobic bike <laughs> that he came up with, and I swear that was the dream that I had last night. And um, and then I just woke up and I was like, man, I was like, this like there's too many good bikes out there. Like, how is this gonna sell? You know, <laughs> and Tyson do it, Lars, bro. So, I got oh no, I got a Tyson story that this is the scariest moment of my life. Like a real Tyson? No, like a real Mike Tyson story. I was at an event, and I'm not going to say which which event it was, but Mike Tyson was there with some people, and Mike Tyson happened to he needed to go to the bathroom, so we had to clear out a bathroom and go in, and people were out there, and they're like, "Yo, just stay in there with him." I'm like, "All right, I'll make sure nobody comes in." Like, "Oh, by the way, he's on a bad mushroom trip right now," and I'm like, "Hold on, wait a minute, what?" <laughs> so now I'm in this bathroom, just me and Mike Tyson, who is on a bad mushroom trip, and I got my hand in the door, like, "Yo, I might die right now," like. <laughs> He could fucking kill. I was sure. literally, I was, I've never been so scared in a moment in my life. I'm yes. Like, this could get really bad so, or this could get really cool. Yeah. Like it go either way. <laughs> but I saw the hang, like there's, I've seen everything and I've watched a lot of Tyson fights and you know, his <laughs> shout out to his podcast, the hot box. They just sit, smoke weed and talk yeah. all day. I hope he, to be on there at some point, but he f- hits the path, he's bro. The, bro. He, he, he still hits the path, but I've met him more than just at that point. And he is, he was so kind and so sweet. He shook my hand, my hand disappeared. Yeah. Like, but in that moment, I was scared shitless. But like the other times I've met him, he's so cool. Yeah. So that, that reminded cool. me, uh, I was working at Greystone and uh, I forget what night it was, but somebody's like, Danny, <clears throat> there's somebody back there walking without their shirt off, just pacing. And like, I would love to t- go tell people shit. Like, I was, oh, on, yeah. I was on my high horse back then, right? So I'm like, 
Yeah, I'm walking over there. This is when I can walk, by the way. <laughs> I, I'm walking back there, and it's smoky, and the lights are. I'm like, I'm about to fucking tell this fool off. Who comes walking at me with a shirt off and a big ass gold chain? Rampage Jackson. Oh, I was like, nope, thank you. I just <laughs> returned. Like, Can I get you anything, sir? Yeah, yeah, he's fine. He had a shirt on. It's good. Oh man. Okay, so speaking but, yeah, of, I saw my life. You know, speaking of iconic moments, I would say the most iconic moment in a restaurant for me. Um, it was the finals where the Mavs played the Miami Heat, and I think it was game four, and uh, Michael Jordan was in one of the private dining rooms with his daughter, just graduated high school, and they were having dinner. Um, and we usually don't bother when there's like a big name like that coming in, so I was like, no, I wear this guy's shoes. This guy had posters on my wall when I was a kid. I'm going to say hi. I walk into the room super confident. I was like, hey, just want to check out and say everything. He didn't even eat. He was sitting in the middle of the room just watching the game. Gets up, shakes my hand. He's like, everything was great, chef. And I I seriously walked home that night just like Skipping. staring at my hand. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm never going to wash my hand yes. again. But I had to wash my hand because of later that night. <laughs> <laughs> Or, so, you know, or we can say you just had to work. You know, you know what like, I mean? It's kind of a thing, but you know, you know, put, you put your I hand mean, in the in the globe like uh, <laughs> like Zoolander. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally in the globe. <laughs> I love the honesty. Today. <laughs> I love the honesty. Today. <laughs> so um, that was probably the most iconic restaurant I, moment I've had, like dealing with a celebrity and you know working with Mastros for so long. Like you really saw them all. My, the first day that I, I worked with Mastros in two thousand eight. Um, they were filming Entourage there, so that was that was pretty cool. You know what I mean? So that was I was that shout day out. I was like, this is gonna be a cool, this is gonna be a cool f- job. So shout out Doug Ellen. We're just gonna keep yeah. shouting about until yeah. eventually <laughs> he f- notices us. I never tell you, dude. Like, come on, bro. I still I took a picture by the the Entourage poster and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the best show. Had to be cool. You know, still had to, man. Still, had still, had still the show. number one show. Still my f- favorite show. Still the number one show. So that was your most iconic. What What was your biggest like? Yo, what the. F- moment like because i've told you i have them at festivals where i'm just like i don't know how the f- I, i'm just i might as well just quit now okay uh, <laughs> like you've definitely had a couple of those I have, i've had a couple of those but there's one kind of that actually the one that kind of rings true more than anything it was valentine's day at um with a company uh src they run castaway and burbank i was um on the project to kind of lead the transformation of castaway from what it used to be to what it is now. Um, I was the first installment in that. And um, it was Valentine's Day. Um, I told them specifically to not book a certain amount of slots per per every 30 minutes. Mm. And they didn't listen and overbooked it. And in the middle of the rush, um, in the middle of the rush, I walked off the line <clears throat> and said, I'm done. Came in the next day, pulled all my stuff out of the office and said, I'm, um, I'm done. And... So they just hit the fan, like you were running out of food. They couldn't no, keep up. No, honestly, it wasn't even that. Like I didn't even want to get into it. I just saw that there was probably about anywhere from 150 to 200 people in line to get to the host stand, and we had a full rail. And I was just like, "This is where." Explain what the full rail is. Full rail is there's tickets on your speed rail where you kind of control everything, where you're calling everything out to the line, but also you're on the expo, so you're selling all the food to make it sure it's ran to the correct tables. I had probably about maybe about 40 tickets hanging from the machine. Oh, I hate that. And then the That's full amazing. rail completely while things were just kind of double stacked in um, portions of just more tickets that had to go in line. And that was probably the first time I ever had like a, an, an anxiety attack. And um, I just left. And Did you walk into the walk-in box and scream? I, I go to the freezer because if I'm in the walk-in box, you can still hear me because <laughs> I go loud and I like to throw things in the kitchen and everybody knows that. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, there's ketchup on the Victorian still at the wall somewhere. <laughs> I feel um, like you haven't worked in hospitality if you didn't have a crying fit in a fucking walk-in oh, freezer. For sure. Like, crying. You didn't really have a true experience. Yeah. yeah. Crying. And, and also, like, it's cool being in the freezer because... You don't really cry because everything just kind of freezes. So <laughs> you walk out a little bit more, a little bit more kind of maintained. And but definitely the the walk in is is where to go to just kind of let let out all the uh, all the and bad. It, it all makes sense, like uh, people doing cl- cold plunges and stuff. Yeah, like, <laughs> now it makes sense. Now okay. we know why. Oh, holy shit, we learned something yeah. today. <laughs> where you knew I was just doing cryo at the restaurant, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> every every uh, restaurant person who's listening to this right now, collectively, I could feel them cringe when you said all the tickets. Oh, like, dude. All the, and coming out of, that's like a nightmare. For sure. That's it's, a nightmare. It's the worst. It's the worst. And um, I'm talking about doing like 150K at Mastro's during the Super Bowl on a, on a Saturday night. And you have the full lineup of every person that's on ESPN. Uh, the Patriots are staying at the hotel right next to us. Not even worse than this. That was going and, and we found a way to get out of it because we were prepared. But I kind of walked into what I would say was doomsday for the first time that I kind of was hanging up my apron in that aspect. So that was the first time I just kind of pulled away. I wanted to pull away from the restaurant scene in general. I wanted to do something that I can control um, and kind of handle things at my own speed and my own pace and not have to react to what was coming in. So what were the challenges when you started that business and what was different? Like what were the unique challenges for that uh, prep meal service? Um, The unique challenges was um, I started that business in my apartment uh, with an electric stove, um, like a Coleman propane grill on the, on the, on the patio. And, um, well, they would do like inspections in, in the apartment complex that I lived in just to make sure everything was kind of working correctly. They actually thought I was, um, dealing drugs <laughs> because they came into my living room and there were eight fridges <laughs> in my bad, living room, <laughs> just like eight fridges with just food and huge pots of things just cooking on the stove on an electric stove. Um, and we did that once we got to like 500, 600 meals every week, um, we went into a, um, a shared kitchen and after the shared kitchen, we, we kind of got up to about 2000 meals a week and then we built out our own facility and the rest was history from there, you know, and we were extremely successful for a long time. And then the pandemic definitely hit us in the mouth. And that's when I just kind of decided to pull the plug. We were kind of going in the wrong direction and, uh, inflation definitely with food and costs and, you know eggs now crazy that's what i was gonna ask because like i imagine during that time everybody wanted their shit prepped and like sent to them yes but you you were fighting there was there was not enough supply of food there wasn't in the beginning remember in the beginning of pandemic when when everything was getting bought anywhere you can go i should remember the toilet paper being yeah it was no it was everything was meat everything was very limited so um i actually ordered like this four thousand dollar freezer to put in my garage and I just filled it up with any meat that I can get, knowing that I'm going to need it for the next couple upcoming weeks. And that got us through the first couple of weeks of pandemic. We were busier than we've ever been before because nobody wanted to leave their house. Yeah. So it, I felt like we were doing a service by just being so helpful from, you know, like everybody thought that this virus was like walking on their lawn and, you know, no one was leaving their house. So it was also like weird um, when our delivery drivers were, were dropping off bags with with gloves masks and once they dropped the bag they'd spray the bag with um lysol yeah and it was like it was crazy it was really something else and um driving on the freeway and there's no cars was it was it was something surreal and like no smog and it was it was kind of crazy like being the people that were actually working and having to have um we had actually have a letter from the city that let us maintain and operate that we were out in public so just because they saw us going from house to house. So um, it was definitely a different time. But um, um, with that with that transition and, and once we just kind of fell off and yeah, it was it was a good run, but it was it was fun. And we definitely changed a lot of lives. We help people lose a lot of weight and, and help people gain weight and kind of do whatever their goals were. So definitely a different vibe. But I w- it was it was nice creating. It was nice creating that aspect as opposed to being in a restaurant and then. The Victorian came calling and jumped right back into it. Yeah. And yeah. But I like, I really do appreciate everything that I've done. So it's really, it's kind of made me who I am today. So what up? Segue perfectly. It's like, so this whole career, this whole change up, what are some of the things that you really appreciate that helps you keep going? Because I mean, brother, kudos to you. You're doing it, but it's still not easy. You're still like, you know, you're, you're still figuring out. You're starting a new business. So to keep you going, what are the things that you appreciate and look forward to that? You know, keep that smile on your face and keep that incredible energy that you have. It's it's doing doing the things that I love with the people that I love, and which is great because the people that I now surround myself with. Um, and the people that actually helped me kind of move to the next step and move to the next level are, are my true friends that I've kind of sifted through over the course of all these years. 
and found more of a core group, you know, and Mikey and, you know, you guys are all part of that core group. And we do feel like we have this circle that we can lean on for any aspect, but that's the driving force is having those people around me, um, knowing that a, what I do helps them, what they do helps me. And we're all just kind of moving in a positive direction. That's, that's definitely the driving force is just kind of enjoying what I'm doing more so than anything. So also where are the pearls from, bro? This is dope. Okay. So this is my boy, uh, um, JP, um, shout out to JP. The brand is a uh, John McCoy. John McCoy. Honestly, I don't, I don't ever okay. wear jewelry, but he started posting this and I was like, yo, I need it. And I've hit him up a few months ago when he started posting and I finally got my hands on some of the pieces. It's very difficult because you know, the, the popular demand, bro. The demand is high. The popular demand. So um, everything's custom, right? Is that correct? These are custom, especially for my big ass neck. Um, so yeah. shout out, shout out to to John McCoy. Follow him on Instagram. Pick up a piece, but uh, these things are these things are lit, and I get nothing but compliments. So, like you were saying, man, it's cool with the people and like sifting out. Like we have, and, and we run in the same circle. You're right. There's a lot of people we've lost over the over the past years, but the smaller group, yo, man, everyone's doing something really. F- cool Everybody and that's them. so dope because right now we're all like especially right now we're all feeding off each other because mm-hmm. again the world is shitty, so you need you need other people to help build you and it's so cool that we have a circle amongst all of us that we're all building each other up and when you win when he wins when jp wins like we all win and we're all so excited to see our friends killing it and like i think that's one of the coolest things about all, everything that we're doing you know entourage said it best and, and honestly i love that show so the favorite show um we're all going to win together. And, and honestly, and I think that we all feel stay true to that. Uh, we're all going to help each other get to where we need to be. And we're definitely all going to win together. So I'm, I'm excited to see what the next year brings and, um, and the years beyond that. So that's it. I like it. We're all going to win together. Well, on that note, yo, Justin, thank you so much for being on. We'll catch you next time. See you on the chaos. Peace.